I wish you luck in realizing your ambition. Hey everyone, it's Blue Lizard Jello, and welcome back to Everything Possible in Elden Ring. Last time we met Bernal and Iron Fist Alexander, we bought a bunch of Ashes of War, some of which we're going to be employing here in just a moment, and we fought our first Death Bird. Now today, we are going to tackle the Death Touch Catacombs. We're going to make our way across this bridge and take a look at all the horrors that await us on the other side, including that lesser pumpkin head, and we are finally, hopefully, if time allows, making our way to the round table hold but before we do that a few bit of housekeeping items we need to attend to first off if you want to take a look at my stats here they are pause it if you want to know anything more about it as for gear we have quite the loadout currently we have the club the falchion the short bow some fire arrows the beast crest heater shield and the standard heater shield we'll talk about that in a moment we have the sham shear for armor, we have the Chain Drape Tabard, the Foot Soldier Gauntlets, and the Aristocrat Boots. I do have the Blue Dance Charm. Frankly, this is doing me no good. As I mentioned, if you're anything over 30 on your equip load, this offers no difference whatsoever. You can see I have plus 17 on my scaling for the club. Take that off, and I'm still at plus 17. Unfortunately, I just don't have any other talismans that are really worth it. And if I put on the Blue Feathered Sprint Sword, which is what we got from killing the Deathbird in the last episode, it actually puts me into heavy load. So I can either go with nothing or the Blue Dancer Charm. Frankly, it really makes zero difference whatsoever. Tell you what, we'll throw on the Arrow's Reach just in case we do end up using the bow. I do have some standard accoutrement here with our flask, some fire grease, the bone darts, holy water pots, and the spear jellyfish ashes just because we left those on from last time. But at any rate, we're going to rest up. Everyone is set up for the Death Touch Catacomb. The first thing we're going to do, we are going to change the skill on the club from Barbaric Roar to the Golden Vow. Let's do that. And we're also going to make that sacred. Most of the enemies inside the catacombs are weak to holy, with the exception of the boss. We are also going to put on this amazing skill, Stormblade, on our Falchion. We'll just keep that as standard to get the most damage. I already have no skill on my Beast Crest Heater Shield. As for my regular Heater Shield, I am going to put on the Stormwall. Again, better parry frames than standard parry, but it does cost 3 FP. There we have it, and tell you what, just for a little bit better lighting, should have done this right from the get-go, I'm going to just wait until morning. And even though we do have the fast travel unlocked, I am just going to ride up here just so you can again see where that catacomb is. And look at that, a pair of golden runes right here in these glowing skulls. Never going to say no to those. I will use those frequently just to get enough in order to eke out a level or buy something that I am looking for. So up here on this little platform, okay, now I have to make a correction. I was under the impression that this ghost wouldn't appear unless it was nightfall, but here it is morning and he's here, so I don't know why my game simply didn't load him the first time. I do want to talk to him again, though. Unthinkable. Our hallowed resting place is violated. To refuse the Erd Tree's call to return to live within death. Sickening. And we will hold on to that while we enter the Death Touch Catacombs because, and I am going to rest here just in case something were to happen, the boss at the end of this is something very, very related to the idea of living beyond death. And we'll talk about that once we actually embrace the boss here. Typical catacomb fashion, we do have this heavy door that we need to find a lever for. Let's go ahead and grab some root resin. Activate this summoning pool. I love the statues on either side of the heavy doors here. And we're just going to start making our way down. So we do have some skeletons. They are weak to strike damage, of course. Well, let's go ahead and just take care of them. We can do some guard counters, which will work out very nicely. I am also going to be using my Golden Vow here in a moment. Now, if I were to use the Holy Water Pots, just like we've seen before, they would not be able to resurrect. But we don't want to use them just yet. I'd rather use them when I have multiples. Let's actually switch over. No, let's actually stick with the Golden Vow. Let's use it. Get a little bit of extra damage here. Oh, the Rolly Boys. You can see that the guard counter is quite forgiving 
time-wise. So even if you don't do it right away, you can absolutely still accomplish that. Here we have it. Over here, we're going to spawn some more skeletons, but we do have a Grave Glove Wart. Quickly take him down. And backstab here. This other one may resurrect before we can get to it. Let's see. Looks like we got him just in time. There we go. You do see a little path here. We are going to be taking that in just a moment. I actually don't want to take it yet. I like to clear some of the other skeletons first. I'm going to focus on the one here with the falchion. Not the one with the bow, if I can help it. Guard counter. I was holding my shield up just because the other one was aiming his bow at me. So let's wait for him to shoot, and then we can finish this one. Remember, you can even guard counter after you block a projectile. I, sh I should also show off the Stormwall Ash of War. Grab some more great glove for it, just so you can see how it does actually deflect the arrows, which is pretty cool. A few more down here. There's also some up above that are going to spawn. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to stay back here. Have you come this way? And we'll just do a guard counter. I do have my bone dart, so I should be able to... Well, it's unfortunate that it was only targeting this further one. Tell you what, if I can get these guys to group together, that would just be absolutely perfect, and we got it. Got a human bone shard. Good little crafting material there. And let's grab your attention. Someone just dropped down. That's alright, it's just one of the archers. Well, that works for me. Although, somehow that didn't knock him down. That's actually very surprising. We are going to go up there in order to get the item up above, although the lever is down here, so it is optional, but it is an item that many, many people like, so I definitely understand that most people want to get it. Let's just circle back around for the backstab. Get that kill there. Now, when we go in to actually get the lever, we are going to be ambushed by a few more skeletons behind us, but that should be A-OK. -okay. More Grave Glove Wart. Grab this Grave Violet. Don't forget over here to grab your three Blood Roses. We got those last time as well. And there's a lever to open up the door. And don't forget to always close that menu. Otherwise, you're going to be stuck in that animation. Or not in that animation, but in that message. Simple guard counter there. This is not a very big catacomb. In fact, we're nearly done with it. Other than the boss, of course. Well, that was just unfortunate timing. I'm going to heal up, play it safe here. Guard counter. We do have a few more holy water pots, and now that we have a really good place where we can get more tarnished golden sunflowers, I really should be using them very judiciously. I like the arrow sticking out of the top of my head. I think it really adds to the look. So now we're just backtracking. We're going to head into this side passage that was just over here. I'm just going to use the holy water pots to make these fights even faster. Just wait for it though. Back here, got a grave violet and a grave club wart. If I can lump them together, that would just be great. There we have it, excellent. Nice clean kill. We are looking for the passageway, which is just here. And our last two pots, perfect. And we get the Uchi Katana. This is the starting katana of the samurai class. So if you start with a samurai, you already have this weapon, but you can get a second one right here. And it has the unsheathed skill. If you've seen my video where I actually took on the grafted scion tutorial with the samurai, I believe I showed this off. It is a very, very effective skill. As you can see, you sheathe the blade, you hold it at your side, and then you can pull it out extremely quickly with either a normal or a strong attack 
which is very nice. It does cost 10 and 15 FP respectively, whether you do a light or a strong attack, but it also, similar to our flail, does have innate blood loss buildup, 45, a little bit more than the flail does. Grab this last Grave Glove Ward, and that is it for the Catacomb other than the boss. Now, if we wanted to, and I may just do this, we could go and rest back up. Here I am getting turned around. We could rest at the Site of Grace. We would have, I believe, just one skeleton in the way, but I still think it's a fairly good idea if you've taken any hits or you've used any flasks, which we have. So I will do that. We can't warp just yet. In fact, if I try, it's going to tell us that we cannot travel to a Site of Grace from this location. The reason being, the boss is still alive. Once the boss is dead, we don't have to worry about that. So what I'm going to do is I am going to rest up. I'm actually going to reallocate our flasks. I'm just going to put an extra one into the Cerulean, just so I can use these skills a bit more. And let's start making our way. Let's just take out... Actually, no, we don't even have a skeleton. Sorry, that is down those stairs. Grab the respawning root resin. This enemy, this boss, fortunately, is already weakened. It is not something that we have to worry about too, too much, although they can be still a bit of a bane. Later on, when we fight these bosses, it gets much, much more difficult. This boss is already missing HP. It is weaker, it is slower, and she can't turn invisible, which her compatriots that will fight later on absolutely can. Fortunately for us, other than Pierce and Holy being their strong suits, everything else is pretty much an even playing field. So whether you have standard damage or slash damage, you can do a fair bit of damage to this enemy. And if you want to buff, using a fire grease is not a terrible idea, but I'm also going to be playing around with Stormblade. Black Knife Assassin. You can see already down about a third of her health. Fortunately for us, this fight is a lot simpler than what they're going to be eventually. Now, they do dodge a lot. They do dodge quite a bit, so it's something that you kind of need to wait for them to get an attack out before you start doing anything. You can see that she does have some pretty fast combos. She also does have a nice, there we go, sliding attack, which can really, really close distance, but she doesn't deal a whole lot of damage. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna try and show off a parry here with Stormwall. So let's actually get up nice and close. Way too early. Try that again. There it is. Decent damage. Now I'm just gonna switch back and we're just going to play around with our dual curve sword setup. I am going to buff here. I should have used Golden Bow again. However, I did forget. Let's just back up. I do want to try and show off this Stormblade if I can, but I know if I try it right now, she's just going to dodge it. But you can see there, got one off. Might actually be able to bait her with the Stormwall because, yeah, unfortunately not. Typically, enemies will go ahead and dodge at the beginning of the cast meaning that they can just end up right in it. But, as you can see, not too difficult of a fight. I am going to use a Pickled Foulfoot here, even though she's not worth a whole lot of runes. But with the Foulfoot, we get 2080, but we also get the Assassin's Crimson Dagger. And now we can spend a moment actually talking about that Assassin. So let's take a look. This is a new talisman for us. Critical hits restore HP. This charm is modeled after the darkly gleaming blades used in the Night of Black Knives, those which gave the demigods their first taste of death. So this is our first clue as to what really happened during that Night of Black Knives, but we're actually going to get some more items in this episode that's going to talk more about it, and we're going to meet someone who has kind of a taste for death in a little bit. What's really nice about this is if you are fishing for backstabs or you're getting really good at your parry and repose, every time you land a critical attack, it is going to heal 85 plus 10% of your missing hit points every time you get a critical. It can be really nice for staying topped off and it does have a Cerulean counterpart which will restore FP. Put those together and if you are, again, hunting for those backstabs or the repose or even just breaking an enemy stance, this can be really, really effective. In fact, we're gonna throw that on because frankly, it's just better than nothing. There is a chest there we're gonna grab. Don't forget to grab some root resin. 
and right here inside the chest, a little bit more root resin over there, we get our very first death root. This is a key item. Let's take a look at the description here. Beast clergyman seeks and devour these. Found at Bestial Sanctum in the distant east, the beast clergyman collects and devours these roots. On the night of the dire plot, the stolen rune of death enabled the first death of a demigod. Later, the rune of death spread across the lands between through the underground roots of the great tree, the earth tree, sprouting in the form of death root. These are the roots of the earth tree. We've talked about how there are already skeletons mixed in and among the roots. The earth tree essentially is feeding off of the dead and lifeless bodies of those that came before. However, as we heard from the ghosts, some of them, some of these individuals who have already faced death or maybe gotten close to death, are refusing to return to the earth tree's roots. That particular black knife assassin was clearly injured probably during the night of black knives and came here in order to seek shelter and to recuperate and that is why the ghost says that they are actually ruining this hallowed place uh, we're going to talk more about the night of black knives and what it means to live beyond death as we continue to collect items related to it but that is it for the death touch catacombs let us just head on out and in fact instead of going to the death touch we're just going to go right over to saint's bridge and yes, I do have quite a bit of runes at this point, 15,000, but I'm not going to spend any yet. We're actually going to wait because we do have a chance to spend these in a way other than leveling here in a bit. And we're just going to actually stick with the exact same setup that we have. I do want to show off the Stormblade a little bit more just because it really is such a fun skill to get early on. I took no damage, but actually got flung by the Lesser Pumpkin Heads head slam attacks but you can see just how quickly you can pump that out it is rather impressive and there's the kill and we got a sanctuary stone of course we can get that helm i mentioned it before but we were not so lucky that time let us use our cerulean tears top that up there is another pair of smithing stone level ones and now we're going to hop on torrent do a little bit of a pass here i am going to make some more holy water pots because we do have some more skeletons and just riding over here to the north just to get, as usual, a single Trina's Lily that's just hidden out here. There it is. And now we're going to head back the way we came. Because just over there, you can see the campfire. We have another merchant. Sells a few interesting items. Nothing absolutely game-breaking, but we want to pick up a few things. I'd love that you could just sit and listen. Oh, dear. Yeah, my, I, terribly sorry. Uh, are you here as a customer? So let's take a look. Pickled turtle knee. So that's going to increase our stamina recovery. More smithing stones. We will gladly take all those. Another crack pot. Absolutely want to have that. And the nomadic warrior's cookbook number three, which will allow us to craft pickled turtle neck, poison bone arrow, poison bone arrow flat, and poison bone bolts. Let's grab that. We can grab a short sword, which we don't have one, so hey, why not? Halberd, same thing. We could have farmed for these already, but we haven't been so lucky. I do not need arrows or bolts. I will grab the bandit mask because at least we can change our fashion a little bit. And then he also sells a note about flame chariots. We haven't encountered a flame chariot, and it's going to be a bit before we do. But let's buy it so we can read what he has to say. Oh, I must apologize. I, I, I'm, I'm afraid of very little to offer. He's so polite. So let's take a look at that note, which is going to be all the way over to the right. I should have actually just gone to the left. And we got the Flame Chariot's note stating, A well-timed blow to the chimney on top may prove effective, but opportunities for a plunging attack will be rare indeed. Beware the Fire Monk's Chariot bearing the faces of giants. You'll know exactly what these are when you see them. But the note is correct. If you can get on top, you can actually kill them in a single hit, but getting on top typically is going to be a bit of a challenge. If we head down that main path, that's when all the skeletons are going to spawn. There is an NPC over there we want to meet, but first we're going to kind of go pretty much entirely out of our way. We'll actually just get on Torrent here. We have some dogs over by these crucifixes that we want to take care of. And I'm actually going to do that just with my storm blade. Makes it really easy. So 
Excellent. Nice and quick. Over in front of the crucifix, we have a golden rune level one. And now you can kind of get an idea for where we are at. Just over my head, that is the Caden Camp where we got the cookbook allowing us to make fire grease. Over this way, we have a site of grace here. This is actually Murkwater. So that statue of roses is pointing to Murkwater Catacombs. And there are the bears that we fought a little bit ago. And of course, there's the artist shack. Here's on the map exactly where we're at. So we are going to kind of follow this ridge line right here. We do have to do a bit of dropping down. So let's actually just get on torrent. These bears, by the way, completely unnecessary to kill. You can if you're looking for what they drop. But frankly, there's nothing in this immediate pool that we need. But since we're here, we might as well. Shouldn't be too difficult, especially with the curved sword combos. Beautiful. Now, I don't want to fight both of them. So let's see if we can get this one's attention. Can even soften them up with a little bit of storm blade. Just going to stand there awkwardly. That is okay with me. And get a sneak attack bonus on this one. Nice charge R2 to start it out. Well, that makes that very simple. Now below this pond, there is actually an arterial leaf. So we want to grab that. So we're just going to head down to here. And just over here, completely hidden out of the way, we have an arterial leaf. We've already been down that way, so we don't need to retrace our steps. Let's head back up top. And over by these archways, there are some more Trina's lilies, but there is going to be a bit of a skeleton ambush. So let's just get ready for that one. So let's run in. Let's grab the trio of Trina's lilies. And then we just start throwing some holy water pots. I should have made some more now that, or at least one more, since I had an extra cracked pot. There we go. And what do we get? Human bone shard. You know, what we could do is actually just soften them up with Stormblade. Easy enough. Top up our flask while we're waiting for him to try and respawn. There we go. Got a flask refill. And now we're actually going to head back up so we can now take that path all the way down. And on the way... I think I just actually ran over a golden rune that I ignored. Let's make another five of those. This is part of that strategy that I love talking about. When you plan what you're going to do and execute that plan, this game can go very, very smoothly. And we're just going to get off torrent because I do want to focus on trying to get these kills. See if I can get the shield that I talked about last time. bolts. Not exactly what we were after, but it's something. There's the NPC we're looking at. Now these skeletons that spawn with the scythe, you have to be wary of them, because they can't cast rates. Rates that will actually do damage to you when they hit you, but also on contact, or when you get close, they will actually explode. I'm going to craft some more of those. There's no mistake, is the death has left its mark once again. Ah, a tarnished are you? I'm known as D. I hunt down those who live in death and weed their death root. Heed my warning. The village here has been touched by death. And worse yet, it is home to a mariner. If you value your life, then go no further. It's interesting that we don't have the option to tell D that we already have a death route, but this is D. He has quite a lengthy quest, a really interesting quest. We're not going to talk about it now because I like to talk about it as it unfolds, but he is very much against those who continue to live in death, who be live beyond death, who refuse to return to the Erd Tree's roots. He is warning us about the village upcoming and how there is a mariner there and we should heed his warning, kind of like Yura and the dragon, but frankly, we can just ignore it. The village here has been touched by death. Turn back while you still can. Such an interesting bit of armor here. You can see 
that he actually has not a second arm, but he actually has some built-in arms within the armor, cradling what appeared to be a silver version of either himself or someone very similar, but that'll make more sense as we continue on his quest. So now we can just ride straight down. We do have a sight of grace over to the right here. Again, just taking any opportunity I can to grab these golden runes. And this boss is nothing too difficult, but what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to switch out my club for the large club. So let's rest up. I'm going to change the Golden Bow Ash of War back over to the large club. Put on Ash of War. There we have it. And I will make that sacred. Then I'm going to, I'm going to have to do a little bit of inventory management here just because I'll be way too heavy if I try and just use this. But if we just get off, let's see. But if we just take off the short bow and the sham shear, that should be enough. And then I'm going to, once we get in there, and there's the mariner right there he was referring to, I am going to use my Flask of Wonders Physic, which does have the Strength Not Crystal tier, meaning I'll be able to one-hand this if I wish. I'm not going to use my Golden Vow, though, until we've already approached the Tibia Mariner, because he is going to leave. But now we'll use it. Find out where he just spawned. Now a lot of people, again, will fight him on horseback. It absolutely works. But in my opinion, it is not necessary. Poor showing so far. Very poor showing so far. Gonna heal up. And there is my golden bow, finally. And there is a wraith. Let's just get up nice and close. See what kind of damage we can do. Now, you can stagger the Mariner, but you cannot get a critical attack. So let's just wait for this stack. When he raises up like that, you don't want to be anywhere near. Okay, just watch it. Okay, there is the stagger. Again, you cannot do a critical watch out when he raises like that he can kill his own skeleton which is very nice he can also hurt you with his water but there is another stagger so let's just get some charge r2s I'm gonna use my golden bow again watch the wraith here if we can help it let's get close enough so it will despawn or actually explode. All right, we're going to heal again. Back up. One more hit is going to do it, and once we kill him, all of the skeletons that he has summoned are going to disappear as well. And there we have it, Tibia Mariner. I will use another gold foot. 3,120 runes. We get another death root, and we get the Skeletal Militiaman Ashes. So the Skeletal Militiamen Ashes will summon two skeletons for us. These are the spirits of militiamen who live in death and will continue to rise again until properly finished off. This is such a wonderful spirit ash to use because as the description implies and as the skeletons that we fought have implied, these enemies will continue to get up provided they are not thoroughly killed. In other words, when they are knocked down and their health is depleted, if they're not hit again, they will continue to resurrect again and again, and it only costs 44 FP, which is not very much at all. Now, let's do a little bit of looting here. Smithing stone level one, a couple of Trina's lilies right here. There are some more skeletons, so let's actually use our Flask of Trillian Tears. Let's just kind of investigate these buildings a little bit. There's not a lot of loot here, and it is fairly spread apart. We just get the preemptive strikes on that. We should be able to get some kills. Human bone shards, plenty of those. There is a trio of mushrooms on that corpse. We are going to head over to this building, but we do have D over there that we can now talk to since we've killed the mariner and collected that death root. But first, do a little golden vow. Why not? him 
down before he can actually raise that sight to us. Great, got that kill. Not really used to the club. And now let's go talk to D. There's still more loot to have, but since we're close to him, let us go and talk to him. Remember, this is a ruin, so if you take a look, now, even though it says Summer Water Village, this is considered a ruin. Notice it has the same symbol as the Gatefront Ruins, meaning there is a basement for us to find. This one is actually locked by our very first imp statue. Another fool who won't listen to reason, eh? But with a prowess for weed in death root. Hmm. How would you like to earn the strength of beasts? If you're inclined to haunt more of those who live in death and weed their death root, then I'll introduce you to Garank. The beast clergyman. I have a matter of my own to attend to, and the beast himself wishes for someone to take my place. What say you? If you miss either of these encounters, which I certainly did on my first playthrough, D is just going to show up at Round Table Hold anyway. But we want to accept this introduction only because it's going to mark the location of a sending gate on our map, which we can then use to teleport straight to the Bestial Sanctum, where the Beast Clergyman, or Garank as he's called, is located. You don't need to have that if you already know where it is, which, hint, it is behind the Third Church America, you can just go straight there. Very well. Show me your map. I've marked the location for you of a hidden gateway. It will lead you to Garank, the beast clergyman. I have a matter I spot an ill omen symbol someone. Must... I just went through that dialogue and I didn't mean to, so I'm actually going to let that play again. What is it? Still milling the map indicates where it will lead you to Well unfortunately we can't get it again, but he's talking about a centipede, and that apparently has an ill omen associated with it. So we'll talk more about centipedes as we encounter more of them, but if we take a look at our map, he has marked this sending gate directly behind the Third Church America, so what we're going to do is we're going to finish up here in some water village. We're going to head up here, not enter this area because this is going to be a zone well beyond our means, but then we're going to kind of hop down these different steps and we're going to head over to the Bestial Sanctum, but not quite done here with the Summon Water Village. Because over here we do have this tower. Nothing in that tower because I always go to the wrong tower. In my notes, I simply have it marked as there is a golden rune inside the tower. Well, I always go to the wrong tower, so now I just have to refresh myself. Hey everyone, this is Editing Blue from the future, and <laughs> while I was looking for that golden rune that was hiding in a tower just over yonder, I actually forgot to pick up the primary or at least one of the primary bits of loot here in Summon Water Village and that is of course using our stone sword key to enter into this fog wall. I don't know. Your guess is as good as mine. I guess I was just in a bit of a recording frenzy but we do have this imp statue over here. Taking a look at the imp head you can see there's only a spot for one key so let's go ahead and use that one. You see we do have a few tortoises around us down in the basement here in Summon Water Village. We have even more tortoises at our disposal, and I really don't like using that term, but if you're looking for turtle neck meat, here you go, a really, really good source of it. I'm going to be leaving them alone. But if you're looking for stamina regeneration, right inside this chest, we get the green turtle talisman. Raises stamina recovery speed. However, those who hold turtles to be wise creatures consider the practice of eating their meat to be barbarous. I agree. But this is a fantastic early game talisman because it increases our stamina recovery by 8 points per second. And this can also stack with the pickled turtle neck meat as well as the great turtle shell that we'll pick up later in the Weeping Peninsula. And now you know. And now back to present day blue bumbling around looking for a golden rune. What tower was I referring to? I do believe that tower is actually up here. Yes, it is. So directly back here, take a left inside this tower. That is where we can find our golden rune level four. Not too bad. 
we have lots and lots of consumable golden runes. So up this hill, that building right up there, that is the smoldering church. Inside of that smoldering church, there's a site of grace, there's some goodies, there's also an NPC invader, and beyond that is going to be Kaled, a land of rot. We do not want yet to go to the land of rot. So instead, what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna head behind Summon Water Village, just south of it, and we're gonna look for a place to drop down. There is a teardrop scarab if you need to have your flasks refilled, but you know what, I actually do. See, we got three out of the four back and we have another field of sarcophagus so i'm going to drop down carefully and we're just going to ride around and collect all the golden runes so we have level one one two another level one another level one they're not all low level i promise there's a five and there's another level one this sarcophagus field actually continues over that way so let's head over here so now we have to manage these stairs fairly carefully and I mess this up pretty routinely so I am half expecting a death I'm fully expecting a death I'll be right back right let's try this again shall we Once you make this last jump, it all becomes a lot easier. I'm just gonna ignore all the dragonflies because you can pretty much just walk down at this point. If you wanna use your bone darts or arrows to kill the great dragonflies or just have them fall to death somehow despite having wings, it's not a terrible idea. Now we are not going to approach that ruin and we're not going to try and listen to the crazy NPC that is up there but we'll have to do that sooner rather than later. Let's just instead run around. There's a four. You know, sometimes this is easier on tour and sometimes it's not. There's a one. Golden rune level two. Another one and a six. Level one and a level four. And on top of this corpse, we get the Fevers or Fevers Cookbook Level 1. You can only craft a single item with this, but what it can craft is immensely, immensely useful. A record of crafting techniques left by a man who was utterly captivated by St. Trina. He continued the search for her in his slumber, and we can now craft sleep pots. We've talked about these sleep status before. Well, now we can craft them. Using only mushrooms and Trina's lilies, and a crack pot, we can craft sleep pots, which does consume FP, so much of the holy water pots, but this is why I go out of my way to find all of the Trina's lilies that I possibly can. Give you the lay of the land just over there. That is where Waypoint Ruins is, just above the large club there. We have some minor earth trees that we haven't visited. Again, we're not going over to that ruin. Instead, what we want to do, we are now going to kind of reverse engineer this. So we want to find a spot that is safe to drop down, which we should be able to do so right here with these large steps. So I'm going to drop. This is still a fatal fall, so be careful. Just walk slowly. Now it is safe to fall. That is the third Church of America, so that should look familiar. Over in this ravine, there is some dangerous, dangerous work there. Let's kill this troll just because we're here, and it is a free thousand runes. I should probably be using a better weapon than this. Should be going down again soon, though. That was a very, very large hit. All right, let's just do a charge R2 to kill him. So it's a thousand runes, and there is a site of grace right here in the Church of America, the third Church of America. So it's not a terrible idea to actually farm 
if you can kill him pretty quickly with a nice setup like the Lord Sworn's Greatsword. Speaking of which, we're going to be getting that out here in a moment, but let's just go take a look at the Sending Gate. I'm not going to take it just yet. We have a little bit of cleanup to do still. But right back here, that is the Sending Gate that will send us to the Bestial Sanctum. But first, I'm going to go up this hill. There is a Teardrop Scarab right away, which I should have mentioned this when we first got to the Third Church America. Because directly behind, you do have an option to get this Ash of War very, very early. And it's extremely, extremely powerful. Right, so let's take care of this Teardrop Scarab now. But of course, we have to miss once just to make sure that it's not fully convinced we're a threat. And with that kill, we get the Sacred Blade Ash of War. A fantastic, a fantastic Ash of Words. Take a look at this. Sacred Blade grants armaments attacks Holy Essence and fires off a Golden Blade projectile. The armament retains its Holy Essence for a while, usable on all melee armaments except whips, fists, and claws. This is such a good Ash of War to get early on. As it says, it does cast off an arc of holy damage. You can actually see it coming off the sword there, and that deals 100% holy damage, but it also adds 90 holy damage to your weapon for 40 seconds. Unlike built-in or innate holy damage, the buff of the holy damage that Sacred Blade gives you for 40 seconds is enough to kill those who live in death. In other words, the resurrecting skeletons, for example, and it will kill them permanently. Extremely, extremely useful. We'll be using this quite a bit. Not, not exclusively, but we will be using this certainly. There is a Spirit Spring there that you can take. There's a number of wolves along this path. I'm actually not too worried about killing all of them just because I want to finish getting all this loot. So what we're gonna do is just kill the ones that are sort of in the way, like this one. And we're gonna grab these neutralizing boluses right here. Many of these small packs of wolves will actually give you a full flask recharge. So it's not worst thing in the world to actually harvest them following this path there's gonna be another troll I'm not going to bother killing it if you wish to you certainly can but just to see you exact or just to show you rather exactly where this lines up that was close <laughs> you don't actually get that attack too often unless you're coming from the bottom of the hill so there is the smoldering church that i talked about there's a bit of lore on those swords but as we crest this hill there you can see someone water village in the distance but for us i don't want to deal with that troll so i'm going to just head over to the spirit spring narrowly miss that breath attack make sure we're hopped in now back here we're gonna pop our head in there's not much we can do because this is actually the rear entrance to the gale tunnel but this is the Gale Tunnel, there is a Site of Grace, and there's actually a familiar face inside. Well, I don't know about a familiar face, a familiar rotund body? Ah, oh, I hadn't expected to see your face again. Are you heading to the Festival of Combat too? Oh, no need to be coy with me. Judging by the fine wallop you gave the old backside earlier, I would venture you're something of a warrior yourself. The mere thought of such a festival gets the blood pumping, eh? Now, now, according to my calculations, passing through this road should lead us to the Kalid Wilds. But, however you slice it, it seems we've reached a dead end. I'm sorry to have raised your hopes, it seems my calculations must have been off. I was created to be a warrior vessel. Many great warriors reside within me, ever dreaming of becoming a great champion. It's my destiny, and the reason for which I quest. It is my ordeal, you could say, to test myself, to better myself, to fell ever greater foes. And then, one day, we'll be a single great champion. The greatest of them all. What do you think, eh? How do you rate my chances? <laughs> 
Alexander mentions that a great many warrior reside inside of him. And you may think, hey, that's a really cool philosophical way of saying that all the ancestors of great warriors past, their spirits live inside you. But what if, hear me out, what if he was being literal? And we'll leave it at that for now. Door doesn't open from this side. Again, like I said, this is the rear exit. There is a smithing stone level four, which is great, except, well, we only have one of them. There's not a whole lot that we can do as of right now. So let's head outside just a little bit more loot before we actually fast travel back to the third church of America. I'm gonna hop back on Torrent. And we are gonna drop down into this other spirit spring that we can see right here. care of these wolves and apparently knock him straight into the rocks there that was interesting he was a uh, rather difficult to hit just now but there we have it but behind that alpha we do have a Trina's Lily again I want to be seeking out as many of these as I can and at this point we now have a total of 30 you do have this other wolf congregation down there if you want to kill but for me I'm just gonna head to the third church of America we're gonna take on this ravine and then Finally, we'll be taking the sending gate. But first, I want to get prepared because we're gonna fight an enemy that I don't recommend anyone fight ever. We're gonna be changing the Ash of War on our Lord Sworn's Greatsword. We're going to be putting on Impaling Thrust. The range on this skill, on this already large weapon, is incredible. It does slightly less stance damage than your stamp moves, but the range and the speed at which it comes out cannot be understated, cannot be overstated. So let's leave it as regular. I am going to take off pretty much everything else. I'm gonna switch out my large club for the Lord Sword's Great Sword. I am gonna put on, however, the short bow. I'm also going to now put on the Arrow's Reach Talisman. You'll see why here in a bit. And I really don't need a shield but it really doesn't matter at this point. What I do need, unfortunately, is some crack pots. It looks like I do have two of them available, so we'll just make two sleep pots, and I'm actually gonna put them over the fire grease. I could actually buff my weapon to make this even easier. In fact, now I'm already rethinking it. I'm gonna do exactly that. <laughs> I'm actually going to put on that fire grease, because we can make more. But we're gonna head up this ravine and again there's very little reason to go up here and there's even less reason to fight the enemy that I'm about to fight and that is because we are going to kill a lesser rune bear and I'll tell you about the strategy here in a moment first off an entire pack of wolves is going to start to try and soften him up for us unfortunately they don't do a great job so instead we're just going to take out some of them with our fire arrows, because we don't want to be fighting the wolves and the bear. Don't get too close. We don't want the bear turning his attention on us yet. There we go. Now the bear is nearly done with the wolves, so we need to be careful. Here's the thing. We made these sleep pots because the rune bears are exceptionally weak to sleep. But they are also exceptionally weak to being staggered and then critical on top of their head. So my plan is, once these wolves are dead, I'm going to hit them with a sleep pot. And we are going to just go in with the impaling, well first we're going to get a critical. As soon as he stands up, we're going to get an impaling thrust because usually two of those is going to be enough to actually get him into a state for another critical. So there's a sleep pot in action, he goes down, there is the bright shiny spot. Oh. I wanted to apply, hopefully it doesn't wake up. There we go, excellent. And just about right away, we're just going to Impaling Thrust. We're gonna stay nice and close. And Impaling Thrust, watch it. And Impaling Thrust again. There is the knockdown, let's get in front. And unfortunately, we missed the critical, but we can get this to proc we should be able to put him to sleep there he goes I'm gonna top off my cerulean there we go and 
another impaling. And again. And again. There we go. He is down. Let's see if we can get the critical for the finish. And there we have it. It's not too terrible, but it's a little bit resource heavy. And you get only about 1,200 runes for it. Maybe not so worth it, but there are a couple of Trina's Lilies, so we just got back our investment. Got some Beast Blood and a Happy Beast Bone, and that is all we want to do here. Lastly, we have the corpse with some, with another Smithy Stone level 2. But now, we're finally ready to take that Sending Gate over to the Bestial Sanctum. Grab this Golden Rune 1. Again, if you want to farm these great dragonflies, I recommend the bone darts. You just have to wait until they stop spinning. And there is a site of brace that we can use, but we don't want to rest at it just yet. And I'll explain why when we get there. Welcome to Grail's Dragon Barrow. And before us is the Bestial Sanctum. You can see we have traveled quite a ways away, even further than when we were first teleported to the Celia Crystal Tunnels. So here is the Third Church of America, here's the Sending Gate, and we were teleported all the way up here into the Northeast. Don't go that way. That is not a statue. And that is not just an enemy, that is a full-on boss, and we are not equipped to handle that just yet. So instead, let's just head inside. Very slow opening doors, as usual. Here is the Bestial Sanctum, and there is Garank. Not a lot to be said from Garank, but we do have the option to hand over some death root. We've collected two, one from the Death Touch Catacombs and the other one from killing the Tibia Mariner. Fortunately for us, we can actually give him both at the same time. I smell it. Death. Feed it me. <laughs> Every time we feed him death root, we will get a new reward. The first death root we gave him gave us the claw mark seal and the beast eye, and then the second one gave us this incantation, the beast seal sling. Let's take a look at each of these items in order. So the beast eye will tremble when we're close to death root. The murky violet iris writhes as if alive. I am not sated. Feed me more. Death. Rank the beast and clergyman, but we also got a casting implement for incantations. That is the claw mark seal. You can see that the claw mark seal has a D in both strength and faith for scaling, which means that as you improve your strength and faith stat, the incant scaling will go up. In fact, two handed the claw mark seal will actually increase the incant scaling because of that added strength bonus. This can cast all incantations, but it is especially effective when you're casting bestial incantations because this will get a 10% bonus to those incantations and this will actually stack with a dagger that's right behind here, although it's going to take a little bit of work to get to it, known as the, and I'm going to do my best to pronounce this correctly, I had to look up the Italian translation, the Cinque Dea or the Cinque Dita, depending on apparently different parts of Italy. That dagger will also improve bestial incantations by 10%, and they will stack multiplicatively. We also got our first incantation, which is the bestial sling. Swiftly flings a number of sharp rock shards. This incantation can be cast without delay after performing another action. It is said that in the time before the Erd Tree, stones were the first weapons of the beast who had gained intelligence. It is very cheap to use. It only takes seven fp to cast it can be cast rapidly very quickly and it only takes one slot and on top of that you only need 10 faith to cast it but it is extremely low damaging not really something that you're going to be using to put out high damage numbers but in pvp if someone's trying to get away in their low health or if you just need to finish off an enemy who's giving you some trouble because they're dancing around the bestial sling can do all right 
Not to mention, if you use something like the Claw Mark Seal and then Beast Seal Sling and the Cinque Dea in the offhand, plus the Blue Dancer Charm, you can actually do okay damage. This is a bit of a shotgun incantation, meaning the projectiles are going to spread out, so it is best used in close range if you can swing it. If you do wish to fight Garank, and notice you can actually summon Spirit Ashes inside of the Beast Seal Sanctum, you can do so. Just know he has 10,620 hit points, but you will get a pretty good reward out of it. You will get an Ancient Dragon Smithing Stone, but you can get that another way, so I don't recommend it. Not to mention, uh, after you give him a fourth Death Root, just rest and you'll see what happens anyway. I don't recommend attacking him. So we are going to grab this Sight of Grace. I'm not going to rest just yet. What I'm going to do instead is just get this so we can fast travel. And then we're going to do something that, well, I have very little practice in and I'm probably going to mess up. But we're going to get, go get two more items behind the Sanctum that require some very precise drops. So heading behind the Sanctum and looking out over the edge, you can see there are some areas down below. There are some man bats down there and that can be a little bit difficult because they are certainly a high level, but we need to get down extremely carefully. You can do this on torrent, you can do this on foot, you can use soft cotton because some of these drops will take some damage, but what we're going to do is find this route. We're going to start dropping down and having some rainbow stones on you is probably a good idea to know exactly where you should be dropping down. We're going to continue to drop here. Then we head out on this branch. I'm going to try and land right on this dome here. The man bats do scale with the area. So just because we're able to kill them easily in other areas doesn't mean we can do so here. So if you see them, your best choice, uh, frankly, is to run. You will get a number of rune fragments as well as sanctuary stones if you just collect all the shinies here. But there's really only two items that we are after. And what I want to do is aim for that ledge right there. It'll be a little bit tricky to pull off. And I may end up pulling out torrent. But what we really want to do is just try and tap that. So tell you what, let's get on Torrent. And I may mess this up, and if I do, we'll just try again. I don't know of the best route to do this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk off in this direction. Then I'm going to use the double jump ability to try and stick that corner landing right here. Okay, and now we should be able to carefully walk off. Perfect. Now let's take a look down. So there is a ledge straight across that we can jump to. There's a man bat. We don't want to deal with that if we can help it. There's another one down there, but I have another ledge. If I just drop here and then double jump, we can just carefully walk down. You can see some rune fragments there. We need to keep going down. This is not the final area, so let's just take a look. We'll drop here. And now we have a man bat, so now we have to start moving a little bit faster. Okay, but as long as we keep using that double jump of torrents, we should be able to do this relatively safely. And now, let's start collecting. So we get some rune fragments. Sanctuary stones. We're going to have to bypass some of these, and they may knock us off. So just be prepared to heal if need be. And here is the first item. I almost just jumped off. We get the Cinque... I can never say the Cinque Dea or the Cinque Dita, depending on, again, what part of Italy you're in. But we have one more item to get right here. And this is the Dragon Crest Shield Talisman. This talisman, this will actually reduce all physical incoming damage by 10%. Just a really good overall talisman to have. And now I want to get back up to the Bestial Sanctum. And it looks like we can do that because we're not too close to the man bats. But we did that kind of in a hurry because I didn't want those man bats to chase us down. So let's take a look at the equipment we just got. So the Cinque Dea is a dagger. It has quick step, which cannot be changed. That is a fixed Ash of War. This is upgraded with somber smithing stones, just like our Reduvia here. But as I mentioned, it does raise the potency of B-Seal incantations by 10%, and it will stack with the Claw Mark Seal. 
This is the first time, other than when we fought the Beastmen of Ferumazula, that we're actually hearing about this area. Short sword given to high ranking clergymen of Ferum Azula. The design celebrates a beast's five fingers, symbolic of the intelligence once granted upon their kind. So the beasts were actually given intelligence somehow, and they were able to, well, think, speak, use tools. They became quite advanced in their civilization. And we also got the Dragon Crest Shield Talisman, just like these other talismans, Flame Drake and Halle Drake. Now we have the Dragon Crest, which is going to increase physical damage by 10%. Again, just a really good overall talisman. We have one more thing that we're going to do, and that is we're going to take a rest. Forgive me. I've been testing you to determine if the Elden Ring would truly have you, if you had the metal to endure this long and arduous path. It seems my worries were unfounded. Torrent had your measure from the very start, whereas I merely pretended. There is but one other thing I can do to offer you guidance. I can take you to the round table hole, gathering place of tarnished champions, guided by grace. The way that this works is the first time you rest at a site of grace outside of Limgrave, and that would have counted when we were transported to the Celia Crystal Tunnels if we had rested at a site of grace outside of the tunnel, but now that we're here at the Bestial Sanctum, this absolutely counts. The other way is if we were to head to Stormvale Castle and die against the boss right at the beginning of Stormvale Castle, then Melina would show up and offer to take us, although it's not really much of an offer because we don't have a choice. Very well. Let my hand rest upon you for but a moment. Welcome to Round Table Hold. And I really like that just before we are sent away, there is a slight glimmer of light coming from Mel in his hand, and I just think that is a nice little touch. But unfortunately, this is going to have to wait till the next episode because we have run out of time. So that is going to do it for this episode of Everything Possible in Elden Ring. I hope you learned something, and if you did, let me know down below in a comment what you learned, or if I missed something, or if you have a better strategy for any of the things we've covered today. Let me know that too so we can all keep learning. And if you made it this far, and if you found any sort of educational or entertaining content in this video, do me a favor, hit that subscribe, hit the like button, and stay tuned for upcoming content. But I want to thank you all so much for watching, and I will see you next time.